International Church of Prague. Uh, in this beautiful morning, uh, I will invite you all to stand with us and um, begin with worship. Please welcome to uh, International Church of Prague. We're delighted to see all of you here. Special welcome to those who are watching online. In a moment, we will uh, extend a special welcome to visitors. So if you're here and have never introduced yourself to us, we would love to know who you are and where you're from and how long you plan to be in Prague if you're here for short term. And if you're visiting online, feel free to uh, chip in on the, the, subject, the message line and just tell us where you're watching from. And if you've never told us who you are, I mean, we see who you are, but still. You know, we just like to know who you are and where you're watching from, see our, who we're connecting with around the world. Oh, we're glad you're either here or watching online. Uh, just a couple of announcements. One, um, just a great Thanksgiving to God. We were able to send, um, well, we'll say 75,000 crowns that uh, you folks gave in obedience to the Lord for relief in Lebanon, uh, plus another 22,000 crowns for Vartan's family. So. We were able to save them, uh, send them some significant help 
Uh, and there is still a little bit more coming in, so if uh, whatever comes in for them, we will send. But uh, just, just we're thankful to God for your generosity and obedience to him. Um, we are still wearing wristbands. Hope you got one of those when you came in, and those are those express your level of social distancing, and so we want to honor that. So if you see anybody with, with red, lots of distance, yellow, less, do elbow shake hands with if you see the green. So there's a chart that explains it a lot better than I just did, so we'll move on. Uh, we're still wearing masks. We recommend that you wear them all the time. We, uh, we uh, ask that everyone wear them while we're singing. Um, and then also, as is our new normal, we're not collecting the offering in bags as we were in the past, but we have uh, two boxes, or we have a box in the back, collect a, don a donation box in the foyer that you can use for, for donations. So feel free to do that if you want to make a cash donation. Uh, the nursery, uh, I believe, will be open. I believe Angel is up there, so if you have smaller children, uh, two and under, is that right, Dan, something like that? Okay. Uh, anybody who has a pass in they need to leave. Okay. So the nursery is right up there, so feel free to make use of that. Um, there is still no children's Sunday school today, so stay tuned for developments there. That is in the works, and once uh, we are ready to do that, we will, of course, announce that. Okay. So any visitors, anyone here would like to introduce yourself to us today? We'll start in this section. All right, we'll go to the center section. Anyone? All right, and this section over here. We're all right, and the balcony. Okay, well, well welcome to everyone. <laughs> Feel empty. I didn't get to embarrass anyone, but. Uh, I'll find a way.
of your promise. You don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or void. For once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound.
bless your name for being with us here in this moment. Thank you for lavishing us in your presence. Amen. Please be seated. Let's, let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you and praise you this morning for who you are. We've been reminded this morning of your greatness, of how you have spoken the world into existence. You've created us, and we are not our own. We're yours. And we, we gladly join voices this morning with our brothers and sisters in this city and around the world and those uh, who have gone before us who are with you already, creatures around your throne, angels and uh, creatures that defy description. And we gladly offer our praise and thanks to you this morning and cry out together with them, worthy is the Lamb. We, we bless you and thank you for all that you are, all that you are to us. We thank you that you've opened our eyes to see your beauty, your glory, your worth, your, the, the weight of your presence, the, the comfort and joy that comes from knowing you. Lord, we're, we're mindful of the price you paid for that to happen. You know, we don't, uh, we take it too lightly, we admit it. We pray that even we might be more mindful of that as well as we approach you. For you are a holy God. You've opened our eyes to see the, the ugliness, the, the treachery, the, the horrible nature of sin. What it does to us, but more what it has done to you, for you still bear the scars of what our sin has done to you. And we regret that, and we are sorry. Even this morning, as we say and hear those words, things come to our minds, and we even now confess to you our sin, our brokenness. We come from you know how many nations this morning, maybe 40, 50, are all broken. We're all broken. The nations are in an uproar. We ask you to have mercy. Father, we especially pray for the country of Lebanon as they continue to recover from this massive explosion. And pray that you will continue to guide your people to a way forward. We pray that in, in the midst of the, the destruction that uh, you will be glorified, that you will give uh, a voice to your people, that they might boldly and clearly declare the good news, that in, in the midst of all of this, in the midst of, of death, you offer life and joy and hope. We lift up the country of Belarus to you as they deal with the results of this contested election and uh, with people being arrested, disappearing, uh, being tortured. There's so much we do not know and, and do not understand. We lift up that country to you and pray that, that you would grant uh, there to be a free and fair and certain election there, that you would grant the observance of just basic human rights to your image bearers. Lord, we pray for those who are in power that they would recognize that you, you bring up and you put down, and that you are the ultimate king. And you would put, somehow, you would put godly and wise counsel in the orbit of those who, who lead that country and others. We pray that for the leaders of other countries as well, that you would put godly counsel in, in their inner circle, that you would put a, a Daniel in Babylon, that you would uh, give them the just a, a keen sense of what is right and wrong, what is good for the nations they serve. They would see themselves as servants and not as, as kings and power brokers. We pray you'd give them the courage to put even their own political future on the line for the good of the people they serve. We 
we ask you to have mercy on the nations that are represented here this morning and, and others that are not. The nations are indeed in an uproar today and, and the gospel is the only hope. So we pray that, that our brothers and sisters in those places will have boldness, that you will grant them just an incredible confidence and joy and hope in you despite what are really trying times and, and terrible circumstances. Give them hope. Give them boldness. Help them to have a, a clear and faithful witness to you in the midst of these times. Would we lift up our fellowship to you? We thank you for bringing us together this morning. We realize again what a privilege that is. And thank you for those who are joining us via the technology that um, you've allowed to happen. That it is, it really is a blessing. We thank you for that. We pray that You'll help us to be faithful as well, day by day, with what you give us. We pray for those within our community who are not here today. They are ill or traveling in crisis and in a valley. We pray that in every circumstance you will protect and provide, grant favor where it is needed, grant comfort, wisdom, whatever is needed. We pray you'll supply in abundance in such a way that, that your hand will be magnified in their lives, that faith will be strengthened, your will will be exalted, your kingdom will be advanced, and the gospel will be heard. And for those who are suffering, we pray for comfort and encouragement, for the, just the sense of your presence that just, um, just cheers every valley, that adds our strength to us in, in the journeys that, where we find ourselves. So we thank you. Thank you so much for Drew and for Becky. We thank you for their service to you here for all that you have done in their lives and, and all that you've woven into them to make them such a blessing to us. As Drew comes to open your word, we pray you will open our eyes to what you have for us and you'll seal it into our hearts that we can follow you more closely, worship you more deeply, and, and love you with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. We love you. We thank you for the gospel. Open our eyes and hearts to it now, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Over the last several weeks, we have been looking at some of the face-to-face -face encounters of Jesus that we see in the Gospels, and we're continuing to do that uh, today, and um, we're just going to preach all the way through until, um, until the resurrection. So um, hang with me. I, I hope it will be a blessing to you. One of the things that Jesus is incredibly passionate about that we discovered last week and, and even the week before in Mark chapter 11 is prayer. He was passionate about his temple because it was designed to be a house of prayer for all nations. And when prayer was no longer happening, when the nations were being kept out, when people were being prevented from offering sacrifices and truly worshiping the Lord, Jesus gets angry. And he drives out the money changers in the temple. And in the end of Mark chapter 11, he gives us some very insightful teaching on prayer, specifically on how you and I as his followers are to hold fast in prayer. And so I'm going to give you just a brief review. I gave you an insert last week. Um, there's some of those out in the, in the entryway if you want one to take with you that's also on um, our website under the media section, and it's in the newsletter as well. And it has some of these points about how to hold fast in prayer. And this is based on Jesus' teaching in Mark chapter 11. And I did it kind of in reverse order because then it made a word. So, um, yeah, I couldn't figure out how to tassif would make a word. So it's fast, to hold fast, and it starts with this forgiveness. Our prayers will not be answered unless we have a right relationship first with God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and our prayers will be hindered if we do not have a right relationship with others. Jesus wants to teach that to us because we are his body. We are one, united in him, and we are invited into the unity of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so our relationship with one another is incredibly important. And Jesus teaches about this in many, many different places. But let me just point out one more as we, as we review this. 
He said this in Matthew chapter 5. He said, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, in other words, that you've caused an offense, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Jesus puts the responsibility on us. If we've offended someone, we need to initiate forgiveness. We need to go and seek their forgiveness for what we have done. And we need to own the offense, not defend it, not justify it, but to recognize that we are to deal with the offenses that we have with one another in the same way that we deal with our offenses before God. In fact, Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Now, our tendency, just to be really blunt and practical, my tendency in my flesh when I offend someone is I'll go and apologize, and then I'll seek ways to, to add in a but, to explain why I did what I did and, and how really I'm right. You just got offended by my rightness. <laughs> and, and, and now imagine if we were to turn that over and do that with God. Do we realize how much worse we just made our sin to try to justify ourselves before God? But God instructs us to be humble before Him and with one another, to forgive others as God has forgiven us and to seek forgiveness in the same way that we would seek forgiveness before Him. So he's, that's the first part that we need to remember. We need to have a right relationship with Him and with one another. The A in, in holding fast is to ask and believe, to fix your heart and eyes on God himself, fully convinced that he will keep his promises. And remember that belief is measured by obedience. I only truly believe that which I obey. So I'm not exercising belief and I'm not asking in the right way if I'm not obeying what he's already told me to do. So ask and believe. The third one, which is so important, is to share our prayers with others. Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray together. And that's why I've encouraged you to form um, prayer bands, to join with, with another person or two or three other people and, and allow God to unite you in prayer and see just how powerful God is. We need to pray together. And Jesus' most important instruction was to trust in God. It sounds so simple, but when we understand he is helping his disciples see this transition from a place of prayer, a place of worship, a place of sacrifice, which was the temple, and changing their hearts and their understanding to a person of prayer, Jesus himself. A person of forgiveness, Jesus himself. A person of sacrifice, that he himself would be the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. We understand how important it is that we don't have to focus in necessarily on a process or even following the pastor's, um, you know, words that he comes up with and alliterations and all that. None of that's really important. But clinging to God, yes. To trust in the person, in the power, and the purpose, and the plan, and the promises of God. When we truly do that, the mountains that are before us can come down because then we're united in the will of God. Well, today we're going to look at another passage on prayer that is often incredibly uh, confusing to people. Jesus, in our encounter, is talking about his kingdom, and he urges us to be engaged persistently, to persevere in the work of prayer. In fact, he says this in Luke chapter 18, verse 1. He told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Now, Jesus gives a parable of contrasts, and he uses a, a, a desperate, unjust situation to illustrate how you and I are to be faithful in prayer. So what I want us to do is we're going to go to the scriptures, we're going to look at it from the Luma Project, and we're going to look at Luke chapter 18. Told his disciples a parable. There we go. 
Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice, so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones, who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Go ahead and fade it out right there. So we won't, we won't get to the next part. Um, I know. Now, this parable is often very confusing because we look at this parable and we're trying to figure out, okay, who do we compare who to? Is God the unjust judge? Well, the answer to that is no. Um, are we like the widow? And the answer to that is yes. But the way to truly understand this parable is to see it in its context. And this is so important when we come to the scriptures at any point in time. When you read something, if it doesn't quite make sense, you need to back up and see what comes before it. You need to set it in its context and see what Jesus is addressing. In chapter 17 of Luke, Jesus is addressing what the world condition will be like before his return. He's talking about a world that is um, falling apart, that is broken, and that is filled with injustice. And so what Jesus is doing is he tells a parable about the realities that you and I will face, that you and I will face unjust judges, unjust leaders. We will face corruption in all different places, in the workplace, in government, in all different sectors of society, we are going to face injustice. And what Jesus is doing is he's setting the stage for us to have the right perspective and to know how we are to respond. That what he calls us to do is to be persistent like the widow, but persistent in prayer and placing our full trust, our, our complete weight on the character, nature, and heart of God who is unlike the unjust judge. He is gracious and he is loving. It's a reminder to us that no matter what we face, no matter how difficult circumstances are, that we have a God who is more powerful than the obstacles, the problems, than the corruption and the injustice in front of us. We have a God where Jesus himself says this in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, when he's writing to the church at Philadelphia, he says, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. We have a God who can open doors. We have a God who can open the heart even of a corrupt dictator, of an unjust judge, of a system of, of government or a system in the workplace or even a system within the church where injustice is allowed to go on and on. And a person who is corrupt in their very heart is in power. One of the encouraging things that we three see through the scripture is that God uses sometimes the most unlikely and sometimes the most disobedient people, people like Nebuchadnezzar, to accomplish his purpose and his will. In fact, there's a similar passage to what I just read in Revelation in the book of Isaiah that talks about how God had appointed Cyrus, the Mede, from um, what would be modern-day Persia or modern-day Iran, how he had um, appointed him to accomplish great things, including bringing back his people to the nation of Israel, to the land of Israel. 
So God can work through any circumstance, and it's a reminder of what Jesus is going to say in, in just a, a few, uh, few days later when in Matthew chapter eight, uh, 28, verses 18 to 20, he comes to him and says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to absorb all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, that promise is incredibly important, not just because it's a command for us to share the gospel, but it's bookended by two things that we have to hold on to. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus Christ. And his promise is he is with you and with me, with everyone who places his trust in him, always, even to the end of the age. So no matter what injustice we face, God is more powerful and he's promised to be with us. That's the confidence that we have in our God, no matter what we face. We need to recognize that prayer in Jesus and through Jesus is more powerful than the opposition that we face. But there in his parable, Jesus asks a very important question. Did you notice it? There at the, at the end of it in verse 8, he asks this question, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Jesus is asking the question that after the years and centuries have passed, when his return comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, Jesus didn't ask, will he find Christians on the earth at his return, but will he find faith? Faith is a muscle upon which the glory of God is lifted up. And like any muscle, it must be exercised or it will experience atrophy. It will get weaker. And the fuel of faith is prayer, persistent prayer, confident prayer, confident not in us, but confident in the God that we pray to. In the scripture, faith, humility, and prayer are all interwoven into the life of a true follower of Jesus Christ. So let me ask Jesus' question to each of us, starting with myself. If Jesus were to return today, how would he find our faith? How would he find the faith condition of your heart and my heart if he was to come back today? How would he find our prayer lives? Is it an afterthought or is it our first priority? Do you pray for God's glory for God's fame? Do you pray for the salvation of others? Do you pray against injustice? Or do we focus mostly on our own wants, our own desires, our own comforts? Which one takes precedent in our heart? And is that the kind of faith that we should have, the kind of prayers that we should have? God tells us to come to him with our needs. But prayer ultimately is not about asking for what we want or even what we need. Prayer ultimately is about knowing God. He needs to be the focus of our prayers and not just the needs and the problems that we have, as important as they are. We need to learn to pray, God, I want to know you. My soul thirsts for you. I know you're coming back, but I don't want to wait until then to know you for who you truly are, to experience your presence. One of the things that uh, has been such a challenge um, in my own heart and life has been uh, our, our Becky and I's sons who are, who are worship leaders. That's one of the things that I hear them pray all the time. He says, Lord, I don't want to be surprised when you come back because I want to know you so well. I want to hunger after you so much that when you come back, I go, I knew you were just like this. I knew this is who you were because I've t already tasted and seen your incredible goodness. If we really want to see transformation in our world and transformation in our hearts, it comes from praying and praying prayers that are focused on God's purpose God's plan, and most of all, on the greatness of who he is. Here's what I've discovered. 
Fervent prayer ignites our faith, leading us to bold Christ-like action and life transformation. That's the thing I want you to take home today. But here's the question. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Well, let's look at the context of that question. Let's look at what comes before this parable. So I want you to, to back up in your, in your Bibles to Luke chapter 17 to see the king's coming return. In Luke chapter 17, verse 20, it says this. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you, in the middle of you. So the first thing that Jesus teaches his disciples and the others that are gathered there with him is to understand that in a very real sense, the kingdom is already here. When we talk about the kingdom of God, the consistent teaching of Jesus is that it is both an already and a not yet reality, meaning that it has already come, we can experience it now, but there is more to come. Its ultimate fulfillment comes at the return of Jesus Christ. But we need to live between that already and the not yet. That's what faith is is living into what God has already given us and shown us in Jesus Christ and living in anticipation of Jesus' return, in confidence that he is the one who will set every injustice right, who will balance the scales and bring everything that is hidden to light. So Jesus tells them first that the kingdom is present. It is already here. That was an important truth for those listening in Jesus' day, and it's an important truth for us as well. We need to live between the true reality of understanding that Jesus' kingdom is already here. There's, he's already given us his presence. If you place your trust in him as Savior and Lord, he has placed your Holy Spirit within you to guide you and direct you, to connect you and empower you to be able to live out his purposes, to live for his kingdom right now. But also we have that anticipation that his visible return is promised. Jesus is coming back, and he will come back in a way that everyone will know that he is there. It will not be a surprise. It will not be a mystery. It will not be something that is hidden. It is something that will be obvious that the king has returned, and no one will miss it. So when is Jesus coming back? That's the question that we, we so like to ask because, you know, there's a per certain part of us when we think back and go, wow, it's been almost 2,000 years. I mean, when is he coming? Can I tell you it is to your advantage that Jesus has not come back already? I don't know if you really thought about that, but if he would have come back towards the end of the first century or any time before, in my case, any time before 1960, um, really long time, you know, for me, actually 1961, I wouldn't exist, and neither would you. Jesus has delayed his return because his passion is for people, for all those who will trust in him to come to faith in him throughout the ages. But he does give us some indication about when he will come. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. Jesus is teaching on this same subject, and we're actually going to look at the, this passage in Matthew 24 and 25 in a, in a couple of weeks, where he gives more indications about the end of the world and, and the, his return. But he says this in verse 13, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. He picks up the same theme of, of the question that he had in Luke about will faith remain at his return? And, and he tells that parable of the persistent widow, the, the one who continued in prayer. But the one who endures to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations or all ethne. Pantata ethne is what it is in the original language. It means every people group. And then the end will come. So in other words, what Jesus is saying is when the gospel has reached to all people groups, whatever exactly that means, Jesus is coming back. 
Now, let me give you some encouragement to see what God has done through his people. It's difficult to get exact um, statistics because statistics can, are all in the way that you frame them. But, but if you take the greatest number from the, some of the studies, they will explore and examine that there are uh, over 17,456 people groups on the face of the earth. That means people who have a unique language, a unique culture, they're connected together within their dialect or location, that they're, very, they're diverse. There are about 17,000 plus people groups. 7,000 of those, 7,400, uh, are considered to be unreached people groups where less than 2% of the population have access or um, have uh, are, are uh, claimed to be followers of Jesus Christ. So less than 2%. From that, though, we discover that incredible amount of work has been done. To date, there are 11,421 people groups on the face of the earth that have the Jesus film in their heart language. The Jesus film is very similar to what we've been watching with the Luma Project. Okay, so great advances of getting the message into the people's heart language has been made. That represents, by the way, 7.1 billion individuals. Out of the 7.5 billion individuals on the face of the earth, 7.1 of them already have the Jesus film in their heart language. 11,877 people groups have at least the New Testament available in their heart language, totaling, again, roughly 7 billion people. There are only 11, 000, or excuse me, 1,162 people groups that do not have either a written language or a, a film an, or an audio translation of their scriptures, of the scriptures in their heart language. But here's what's really cool, is when we look at it and we go, and, if, and, it, and as I did this research with finishing the task, if you count the people who are unengaged, which means that there's no one yet working on getting the gospel translated into their heart language on the face of the earth, and you see on the map, you see these areas that are red, those are actually dots where people groups are, and you can see that the vast majority of them right now are in India. That's the, that's the place where the greatest concentration of unreached people groups are. But if you were to narrow it down even more to look at those who are unengaged, who do not have someone actively laboring to bring the scriptures and the message of Jesus Christ into their heart language, do you know that it's only 218 people groups that are people groups of over 500 people or more? Isn't that amazing? Do you, do you see, if we were to look at how the gospel has progressed across the face of the earth from, when, from Jesus' day, from the early church, we see that it truly is being preached to all people groups. And there's only 218 people groups who do not yet have, of, of 500 or more, who do not yet have the gospel in their language. The two of those that are closest to us, one of which is in Belarus, there are 94,000 deaf people in Belarus that do not have anyone actively working to reach them with sign language and with communication in, in their heart language, in the way they can communicate. That's the closest one to us, the largest one to us. The gospel is going out. And I tell you that for this reason. To know that God is working, he is working through his church, he's accomplishing incredible things, and that his return could be very soon. And it should empower us and engage us to say, you know what? I want to be a part of helping to connect with one of those. We as a church need to be a part of helping to connect to those so we could mark that down to 217. And if each church began to work together towards pursuing that, 
It would hasten the return of Jesus, but even more importantly, we would see more and more people come to know him as Savior and as Lord. So his return is getting close. Well, Jesus goes on and he gives some signs of his return. He says, first of all, in verse 22, that his return will be desired by his true followers. The days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. In other words, what Jesus is saying, it's going to get to the point where you're longing for Jesus' return. The circumstances in the world and the condition of our world are going to be such, and your heart is going to be softened to the point where you really, really desire for Jesus to come back. Not just to escape your problems, but because you want to see him be exalted. One of the true measurements of our faith is whether or not we greatly desire Jesus' return. That's why Jesus asked this question. When he returns, will he find faith? Because we need to examine our own heart and ask that question, Lord, do I really want your return? Or do I just want your blessings? Secondly, Jesus' return will be displayed for all to see. He tells us he's, he's, he's coming back, but it's not going to be in secret. One of the signs of a cult is that they may claim that Jesus has already returned, but only a few people know about it. That's the condition of the Jehovah's Witnesses who claim that Jesus returned in 1904 and that he set up his kingdom, which is why their churches are called kingdom halls, and they claim he came in secret. But look what the scripture says. Verse 23, and they will say to you, look there or look here. Do not go, out, not go out and follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. In other words, he's saying just like a flash of lightning where you cannot miss it. Even if you're indoors, the way it lights up the rooms and the windows, you are not going to miss the coming of Jesus. He is not coming back in secret. Jesus says when he comes, it will be incredibly evident to every person on the face of the earth. Now, no one knows the day or the hour. In fact, he tells us this very specifically in Matthew 24, 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. And sometimes that's puzzling for folks because they think, well, how can Jesus be God and be omniscient and not know that? It's, it actually is based upon a tradition that happens within Judaism at a wedding. When you read through some of the, the stories and the parables that Jesus told about weddings, um, like when the, the ten virgins are waiting for the bridegroom to come and they don't know when he's going to come and they have to keep their lamps ready, it's because the tradition was that the bridegroom, the groom, would go to his father and when his father said, yes, now is the time, go and get your bride, that is when the wedding happened. And the father took great joy and pleasure in, in letting everyone anticipate that moment. Jesus has given honor to the Father and saying, Father, that is your decision. That is your call. So it will be at the word of the Father when he tells his son, it is time. Go and receive your bride, the church. But the heart of the kingdom has already been displayed in the sacrifice of Jesus. That's what he says in the next verse. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for us. But he also predicted how people would reject him, how Israel would turn away from him, along with many others. But his followers are to pray always and not lose heart. That's why he told the parable. Because Jesus has delayed his return until the work of the church is done, until the gospel has gone out to all people groups. But we need to remember that his return is not just a day of celebration for the church, it is also a day of judgment. For Jesus' return will destroy the unprepared. Look at the next verses, verse 25 in chapter 17. 
But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. But as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out of Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. This passage simply means that life is going to go on. The pursuit of the world and of of most of the people in it is going to be focused on what's in front of them rather than on God. They'll be focused on their own desires, their own wants, their own comforts, and yet judgment will come. For years, Noah worked on the ark. He built it, and he had told the people that they needed to repent, but they did not listen. They saw him building the ark, and they thought uh, likely he was crazy. Then one day, God says, Noah, it's time, and it happened. And for the very first time on planet Earth, it rained, and the flood came. Jesus is telling us it's going to be just like that at his return. Most people will be so caught up in their own lives, in their own agenda, that they'll be unprepared. That's why it's so important for us to share the gospel with others so that they may know our Savior. They may find life in Christ. But also, we need to recognize the final thing that he tells us about this is that Jesus' return will disclose or reveal our true spiritual condition. He says this, verse 31. On that day, let the one who is in the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. I tell you that in that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. Jesus is reminding us that our life is more than our positions. It's more than our work. It's more than our possessions. Life is about a relationship with him. And if we're not prepared, we will face judgment. Those are sobering words, and we don't like to hear it, but we need to remember that Jesus, who is gracious and merciful, gentle and lowly, is also King of kings and Lord of lords and righteous judge. And we must live in the balance between those two. Jesus is telling that his return will reveal the true condition of our hearts spiritually. Proximity, being close, is not enough. Having a spouse or a family member who is a believer is not enough. Going to church is not enough. That's why you have the example of Lot's wife. Lot was was considered righteous. He was saved, but his wife was not. And so God gives us a reminder that we need to take this seriously. He tells us whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses, who gives their life, gives control of their life to the Lord will keep it. And then he goes on and says that the mark of a true follower of Christ is persistence in prayer. And he tells that parable of the widow. Like the widow in the parable, we are to be persistent in seeking the Lord, in standing in the gap for others who face injustice, and to recognize that fervent prayer ignites our faith, leading us to bold Christ-like action and life transformation because it is the work that we are called to do as followers of Jesus. That's what we're called to. So how, what about our prayers? How does God answer our prayers? Real quickly, We need to remember that Jesus answers our prayers. The king will answer what you and I pray. And there are several different answers we can receive. The one we all hope for is yes. 
I don't need to explain much more about that. That's what you want when you prayed it to begin with, is God just say yes. But he doesn't always say yes. Sometimes he says, no, it's not good for you. A yes would keep you from drawing closer to me. I, I love this. The saints of old used to have this prayer. This is, this is a Puritan prayer that I've kind of rephrased a little bit. Lord, in very love, refuse whatever you see that our hearts would abuse. Isn't that good? Lord, if there's something that I'm asking for that if you actually gave it to me, I would turn it into an idol or I would tend to, to use it and it's the pursuit of using it would draw me farther away from you or cause conflict or harm to another, then Lord, I pray you would say no because I know you want best. Sometimes God says no because also we are in rebellion against him. We're asking for something that he's already said, that's not my will. Sometimes God says no because I have something bigger and better for you. We may pray for healing and the disease continues, but God reminds us that he has gone to prepare a place for us that where he is, we may be also. We can trust in him and his prayers his, excuse me, his answers to our prayers are ultimately for his glory and our good. Also, sometimes God says not yet. And the reason he says not yet is because others are involved in the timing and the fulfillment of our request. But God tells us that what we are to do is to prove our faith by being consistent and being persistent in prayer. Prayer and faith stand and fall together. If we lose heart and we drift away in prayer, we will soon find that our faith becomes weak and that our doubts will increase because faith is a muscle that is exercised by prayer and by obedience. So Jesus said that the purpose of that parable about the unjust judge and the persistent widow was to compel us to pray always, to recognize we're going to face injustice. The reality of life is we're going we're to face circumstances like the people of Belarus are facing right now, where there's an unjust person in power. And we need to pray and intercede for them, pray for the freedom of the gospel to be expressed, pray for the, the violence to stop, pray that God's will will be done and that the corruption will be brought down and we need to pray diligently. And the same is true not just in nations, but in our own lives, in our families, in the workplace. We need to become more and more a people of prayer, to be consistent and persistent in prayer. So I want to leave you with this challenge. I want to leave you with a kingdom push. And I really had to stretch my words on this one because I put two U's in the word push. Okay, and it simply is, the, and I even cheated on one of the U's. Pray until you see him, okay? That's the kingdom push. Pray until you see him. It's not very good, but maybe you'll remember it, okay? It's, a, it's as good as I could come up with. That's what he's telling us to do. Here's what that means. Pray until you see him with eyes of love so that he is your only focus in worship. How would my times of prayer, my times of devotion, my times of worship change if that became my prayer? And Jesus, I want you to be my only focus. Pray until you see his reflection in your attitude and love towards others. Pray until you see his likeness take control of your desires and of your thoughts. Do you see? What we're praying, we're praying until we see him, not just his return, praying to see him in worship, praying to see him in our attitudes, praying to see him in our love. Pray until you see him in the lives of your friends, family members, and acquaintances that do not yet know him as Savior and Lord. That's why we intercede for them. And here, remember, fervent prayer 
ultimately will lead to Christ-like action. If you begin to pray this, you're going to start sharing your faith with them. Because fervent prayer always leads to Christ-like action and life transformation. Pray to see him in justice for the oppressed and the persecuted. Pray until you see him proclaim to every people on the face of the earth, every people group, and pray for us for, as a church that God will lead us to know how we should be more um, involved in reaching those who do not yet know him. Pray until you see him proclaimed amongst every people group. And pray until you see him return as King of kings and Lord of lords. The promise of the scripture is that the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So let us become more and more a people committed to pray until he comes. To Heavenly Father, Lord, would you press upon our hearts and our minds the privilege and the power that we have been given in coming to you through Jesus Christ in prayer. Lord, would you teach us and encourage us to become a people who persistently pray. No matter what we're facing with, with our life, no matter how difficult the circumstances, Lord, let us become a people that hold fast to you in prayer. And Lord, would you teach us to pray until we see Jesus, until we see him as the only object of our worship, until we see him as the deepest desire of our hearts, until we see his reflection in our lives, in our attitudes, in our thoughts, in our love for others, until we see him in the hearts of our friends and loved ones and coworkers as they come to discover him as Savior and as Lord. And Lord, would you cause us to truly desire for all the world to see him at his return because then every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Um, just a reminder as we leave to do our, let's do our visiting outside in terms of social distancing, that sort of stuff. And it's been good to be here, be, be together today. Um, as a, a vision that nurtures that prayer that we've heard about today, we have uh, as a benediction from the end of the letter from Jude, where he says, Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. To him be glory and majesty and dominion and power before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. My wrestling and my doubts and my feathers you won't walk out. house.